Hey, everybody, welcome to Twig 129. We've got a great episode for you today. Today, we're going to be covering first, App Love and Shares fall 19% in market debut from the Wall Street Journal. Second, Sony wants to bring its top PlayStation franchises to mobile from TechSpot. And third, multiple potential buyers interested in Square Enix reporting. Square Enix denies Microsoft or Sony are trying to buy them from Bloomberg, Japan, and Forbes. Oh, that's two articles. So it's about Square Enix. They were like, and... <laughs> they were one after the other, right? It was like in succession, boom, boom. Okay. So. Hey, any updates from you guys? I actually have a useful update for myself. I just started using Superhuman, the email service. And I got to say, it's it's so much more, <laughs> more efficient and effective than using a regular email client isn't like it, Outlook. Like Outlook is so bad. It's so terrible. Yeah. And isn't, so that like guys, $40, isn't that like $40 a month or something insane? 30 a month. But just, just think about- a month? Just think Ugh. about your time, though, and how valuable your time is. I it's, am so sick of fucking paying for subscriptions. <laughs> I, I, I I want to avoid all subscriptions at this point in my life, yeah. but they're just adding up. I, I actually should do a, the math about actually what my subscription cost is on a monthly basis. But what, what's the value, Joe? What's the value of? Yeah. of I mean, you have multiple email accounts or like all, the the really lame stuff that Outlook should have figured out a long time ago, just like shortcut keys to archive, to like put stuff into folders, to create email templates. Like, I mean, it's not like, I don't, I, I have no idea what Microsoft PMs, especially on Outlook are doing or thinking, but like, <laughs> and, and to be honest, like 30 bucks a month is probably a, is overpriced for what they offer because it's kind of relatively straightforward, but they actually do it. you know. And so superhuman saves so much time. So Anyone out there, I highly recommend it. It's going to save you at least, just, just think about the value of your time. It's going to save you at least two to three hours a month at, at the minimum. So definitely worth 30 bucks a month. This is, yeah. JK is, is definitely going to the VC route because every time you get an email from a VC, <laughs> it's sent from superhuman. <laughs> no, I just found like, what was it? Outlook finally added snooze like a year ago. And my life like fundamentally changed, right? Like I'm just so used to using Google inbox, Google, Google mail, snoozing, archiving, all that stuff. Switching to Outlook was so painful and finally oh. adding snooze finally allowed me to prioritize my time. No. That, that, that product is so freaking complicated and yet it's still not effective at all. Like not effective I, at all. I don't no. get it. I, I don't understand how they could be in this. Like, I guess it's, I guess it's just legacy shit. They just can't undo what they had all this time, but just, I don't know. It's like one of those products they just keep adding, 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 and it's just a mess, you know? <laughs> There's no efficiency no. whatsoever. I mean, you guys- I have, to, I have to say, since the last episode, we are talking Wild Rift, and I became the, the Riot hater <laughs> with my prediction. So I had to go and play a little bit Wild Rift. Now I'm fucking hooked. I hated it. I, I knew that this would happen, and now I'm losing my time playing Wild Rift. Are you just, ranked? What are you ranked? I, I don't, I'm not ranked, but I'm playing it every <laughs> <Come> day. <on. laughs> I'm playing in the, and then I, so, like, the worst thing happened. The worst thing happened when I, where I was supposed to have a call, like, I'm not going to say who the person who was supposed to have a call with, but I may have faded our call because I was playing Wild Rift and I didn't want <laughs> AFK. So. Yeah, Wild Rift's my main game now, too. And, but I mean, I don't play much, but at least I'm, I'm like, you know, at least silver. <laughs> but, but, so, and, and, I, and I went to the rabbit hole of Riot. And so I'm like, okay, since I'm now in Wild Rift, let me install again TFT for the nth time. Dude, that, that game cannot make a billion. Like it can <laughs> play a couple of times. It's every time harder and harder to get back into the game because it like it changes the meta 100%. Like half of the characters are changed. You come in, you don't know how to play this. There are new origins, there are new classes. And the game just kicks you in the head. I'm like, I, I don't what are we know. talking like, about? Team fight tactics? Yeah. I, I yeah. like the the most punishing game to get back into is team fight tactics. Like you could be ranked, you could come back and just get demolished because they've changed the meta. Like just changed it. Wow. 13 million revenue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were there were a lot of rumors about new changes to monetization. I don't know if those experiments have already run or not, but they, maybe not. But they, <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe they but, don't work out. <laughs> but actually, from the data, it suggests that they actually have an audience that is pretty freaking loyal to this game that keeps coming back. 
Maybe they did yeah. figure out monetization, but we've That's... talked about this a million times. All right, let's go to updates. Mr. Adam, tell for Yeah, so I've got two corrections from last time. Um, number one, the obvious one, I totally jumped the gun on IDFA. Um, yeah, I was, I assumed because I was seeing the headlines and uh, seeing ATT pop ups and games that it was already rolled out, but that was clearly my bad. Uh, that was just games experimenting. So um, IDFA is going to be rolled out with iOS 14.5, which is rumored to be starting today, which is April 20th, um, but nothing's confirmed yet. So we'll see what happens today at the Apple announcements if uh, IDFA starts rolling out um, or if we still have to wait. Um, second update, correction, um, NBA Top Shots. So uh, Ethan Levy reached out, corrected me. Uh, I said that you needed to wait six to eight weeks in order to withdraw cash uh, from Top Shots. Um, and assuming that was pretty much every single time you wanted to, to convert uh, to dollars, but this six to eight window is actually or six to eight week window is actually only once, just to validate your credentials. So then after that, it's much faster. Uh, all right, but that's still horrible. <laughs> I mean, I mean that that's is like fine, but I, I still got to I still got to say, it, dude, you want to talk about the last fool theory? This is like the definition of last fool theory, right? Six to eight week you know, a uh, difference between when you can sell. I mean, that's nuts, right? Yeah, yeah. All we right. talked about that last time. Yeah, let's not get too they, deep into Those it. motherfuckers <laughs> did two rounds in two weeks, right? They just raised I've like already, a oh, man. It's not even a topic, Eric. I've already triggered you. <laughs> oh my God, no, but I, it, it is unbelievable. It is unbelievable. I mean, Madoff would be like, like praising these guys. You know what I mean? Like, yep. oh God, yeah, of course. Crazy. Yep. It is so nuts. Anyways, um, Joe, you want to talk about Amazon? Yeah. From yeah. a quick update on my side, actually, yeah. before we jump into Amazon, because that's more concrete information. So um, I was so we talked a few episodes back. We talked about Warpath. We talked about it on Twig. We talked about it on <clears throat> on growth triggers. How amazing their launch trailers! This is the Forex game from Lilith, um, the makers of Rise of Kingdom, the makers of of AFK Arena. They had a really strong start on Google Play and current standing. I just wanted to update on this. So the revenue is about five million a month, not a lot since since launch. At the same point, Rise of Kingdoms, their first Forex game, was making 50 millions at this exact same point, seven months into launch. And State of Survival, which is the scaling uh, fun plus game, which has now changed it, its name or its branding towards um, Walking Dead, was about 10 million at this point. The RPI is looking pretty juicy for this game. So we got a global RPI of $4.4. This is uh, twice actually what State of Survival had at this same point uh, and uh, about a buck lower than what Rise of Kingdoms had at the same point. And where this really gets interesting and why the RPI is probably a little bit higher than, than State of Survival is that the downloads are halved compared to Rise of Kingdoms and state of survival at the same point in their in the launch era so i'm i keep mainly looking at it because lilith is a fantastic publisher developer and forex genre is, is just something very interesting for me and it's interesting to see how this genre evolves with the idfa deprecation that is you know basically how this very whale driven genre is going to evolve as these things are changing and and you know based on only warpath at this point it seems like it's it's not scaling as fast. It might be the game, though. I think the game is pretty fantastic. So no, I mean, look, uh, if, you look at, if you look at the downloads, they haven't spent a nickel on the U.S. for the entire history until like March fifteenth, and then they started yeah. spending in the U.S. So they have a different yeah. UA strategy than those other games. It's clear. I don't know exactly why, but yeah, exactly. Even because they have Rise of Kingdoms, so it's kind of. And they were in the Google, they were in soft launch for a relatively short amount of time, just probably because of this ATT debacle coming in. So they kind of pushed the, the pedal to the metal. It is a very, very good game. And I really like how Lilith makes RPGs extremely accessible, but fantastically deep. And the same thing happens with 4X. Very, very accessible, almost like an RTS feelish to the game. But again, all of the meta systems, everything kind of reminds me of a little bit of a, like a, a deeper version of a Scopely Star Trek Fleet Command. So uh, good job, Lilith, and, and interesting to follow how this scales. Okay, update from me, a couple updates. First, Amazon cancels Lord of the Rings game announced two years ago. So according to Bloomberg, Amazon had been working on a Lord of the Rings game with China-based Leyao Technologies Holdings, which was purchased by Tencent last December. 
So unfortunately, it sounds like contract negotiations led to some kind of dispute that caused the game's cancellation. I think that's a major bummer. Definitely Lord of the Rings IP is a really great IP to make a game with. But yeah, it's a, it's a shame. Uh, hopefully Amazon will come up with some other stuff. And the second announcement I want to make is I want to announce my retirement. So we started Twig a few years ago. It's been super fun weekly activity. It's helped make a lot of introductions in the industry. Got to know you guys a lot better. Proud of how you know successful and how big the podcast has become. But having said that, I, I think these guys know I've been super busy. And as I zero-based budgeted my time, for me, I want to probably do less content, but more deep dives on stuff. And uh, I've been doing this, like I started this finance <laughs> podcast because I, I suck at investing, but all the mistakes and lessons I've learned. So for anyone interested in, in stock market investing, check out Super Stock Brothers podcast <laughs> on, on YouTube. But I do this thing with Miro. And so I'm, I'm going to start messing around with that. But anyway, I do think uh, for... If anyone out there is interested in being a host on Twig, let these guys know. Or I think, you know, Eric Sufert would be amazing. So if you have two Eric's, it'd be Eric squared. <laughs> <laughs> too much Eric. Too much. Be way Eric. too saucy. Yeah, too way too saucy. <laughs> but but it, maybe. So, I don't know. I'm still in the denial phase of this, right? Yeah. Like you're retiring, yeah, be, but like you'll be crawling. You'll back be back. Yeah. You'll be back. <laughs> Super I give this stunk, a, I give this a quarter. Sure. Two quarters. Yeah. <laughs> Prioritizing some I'll, stock I'll, podcast. For dude, sure. What do you want to do? Hang out with your family or something? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> give me a break. Yeah. yeah, your kid's gonna be so old soon. They're gonna be like, "Dad, go do some something." You're you well, know. you know. That's the other thing. So I, I realized my 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 son, who's nine years old. He listens to this podcast because <laughs> no, you know, we've got a lot of cursing and stuff. And so uh, now I feel bad. <laughs> Asher, if you're listening, you. stop listening. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> all right, moving on, moving on. Um, all right, let's start with the uh, the first article of the day, and that is App Lovin'. So long threads on the deconstructor from Slack channel. Yikes. Um, let's let's get back to the basics. So they launched at $70 per share. No, it was $80. Uh, it was 80? It was $80, dude. They're down significantly. Yes. Okay, because $80. when I looked at the uh, on the Google chart, it started because, at 70. Yeah, because they never got to 780, right? Because oh shit. Anyway, down day one. So <laughs> they launched at 80, not even 70, which it was on Google Invest. Uh, they were down from 70, they were down about 19% yesterday to 57. I haven't looked at the today. And the de decline seems to have slowed down, but it still continues. Yesterday, also, the Shaw Law Firm announced its investigation claims against AppLovin Corporation. So the investigation focused on whether AppLovin issued false and or misleading statements and or failed to disclose information pertinent to investor. So why this is happening, I'm going to quote another Eric, Eric Handler, an analyst at MKM Partners. Uh, he sa said the, the trading decline Thursday may stem from how investors are thinking about the two sides of AppLovin's business. AppLovin was trying to get a multiple more in line with an ad tech platform play, Mr. Handler said. In reality, much of their revenue comes from their own first party games. So again, I, I said something about 86% of, of the revenue coming in uh, from games. And then I was uh, chastised for mixing apples and oranges. <laughs> that stemmed to, uh, to a whole thread. So, so let's get back to it. And I want to give a shout out to Sergey from Game Invest Newsletter. He sent me some of his notes that were fantastic. And if you're not subscribing to the Game Invest Newsletter, please do that. Anyway, uh, so AppLovin has a diversified portfolio of over 200 free-to-play mobile games across five genres run by 12 studios, including studios they own and others that they partner with. They got 32 million users daily. Uh, their competitive advantage is the own studios and the partner studios utilize their software to market and monetize apps. When using the software, they, their apps have an economic advantage, which benefits business as a whole. So, um, you know, in their portfolio, 31% 
comes from two games uh, in, terms of, in terms of revenue, that's Matching to Mansion and Wordscapes. Uh, but the, uh, the confusing part is this. So they got three business directions and two revenue sources. The, the business directions are core technologies, which essentially means infrastructure. Uh, then there's software, which means software. And then there's apps, which essentially means games. And the way they've divided this, as the uh, Eric Handler said, is that business revenue makes 49% and consumer revenue makes 51%. But then when you start looking at the documents a little bit deeper, you understand that 71% out of the 49% of business revenue comes from advertisers that purchase ad inventory from AppLovin's diverse portfolio of apps. And only rest of it comes from software and core. And then what consumer revenue means is the in-app purchases made by users within AppLovin's apps. So as I said in the last episode, 86% of the revenue comes from games. This is calculated in a way that 35% comes from ad revenue. Of the business revenue is, is 35% is actually ad revenue and 51% is in-app revenue. So what this means is, is that you know this is very much a gaming company. Now, there's, a, there's tons of details as I go deeper and deeper into analyzing the whole business model. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna bore you with that, but basically just gonna say that, or I'm not, if you're interested, just, just subscribe to the newsletters of Game Invest. But the summary is that, that all of AppLovin's growth really comes from acquisition of different apps and operating these apps. It doesn't come from the software solutions. And they demonstrated the growth in 2019 because of these acquisitions and operations of these games. And at the same time, they showed almost declining revenue from business software solutions. So what this really you know, puts AppLovin into position where they're more of a gaming company uh, with growth primarily driven by apps and by apps, we mean actually games. And a lot of these games were acquired throughout last couple of years. Without these acquisitions, you know, the growth of this company would probably stop or decline, which is, you know, quite typical with, with most of the, most of the uh, the big companies, they do acquire a lot of companies and that's where the go growth comes from. And actually Lion Studios, which is their hyper casual developer, it does make some revenue, but that's quite modest compared to, to other big games that they have, like the, uh, the, you know, Magic Tavern and so forth. The current valuation is above market multiples for the gaming companies and thus does not represent the fair value of the business. That's just why the other uh, stock is declining. And, you know, we've had debates about this and, and I've kind of raised that the adjust acquisition, which is an attribution platform. Uh, I think it has a lot to do not only with the data that it gives to improve the, uh, the games business, but it also has to, has to, you know, a way to do in the optics because that increases the revenue they're getting from software and actually adjust acquisition is the biggest one that they've made. It costs a billion dollars. So <clears throat> kind of like these are these are just uh, information that I've gathered by my personal take is is I still believe in Apple Oven. I mean, it's a it's a well run company. Uh, and um, I think once the, the sort of uh, these ad tech multipliers evaporate, uh, yeah. I think the company's set up pretty well for the future. It is a it is a very, um, it's, a, it's a smart games business. But personally, also, I'm, I'm a little bit bothered by how Uplovin has, has operated in sort of a gray area. Nothing illegal or nothing like that, but it is a little bit gray stuff. Like the Firecraft Studios was the first thing. That was in 2018 with the Matching Dimension. Like there's no such thing as Firecraft Studios. And the fact that that game was made by Magic Tavern somewhere out of Beijing, and they pretended that that game came from San Mateo Coffee Shop. It was just weird. We've never seen anything like this where, where the developer or the publisher hides the development studio and the game was, was you know, very much inspired by Playrix games. And that led to the whole UA war between the two. Um, and this, and now kind of like the second part of this operating in the gray area, in my opinion, is, is you know, basically selling yourself as an ad tech company uh, through through this this way how they communicate their revenues you know it's 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 kind of it's it's just it's just weird uh but at the same time we've seen similar t things happen with with unity and we've raised those things up as well and um and finally 
like what bothers me as an investor, I'm, I'm not having bought the stock yet. I'm kind of waiting for the, for the, for the, for the, pri- for the right price. But I, I think some of the discussions that you hear on the streets, uh, word on the street is, is quite often when you're dealing with app loving, I haven't dealt personally. So this is, this is just coming from others is that it feels like, you know, they feel that they're above the game industry, uh, despite the fact that, that most of their revenue is coming from games and, and, you know, they're kind of portraying themselves as a software company or a flywheel company and whatever, you, whatever you want to call it. So, uh, that's, that's my analysis. And that's, that's a lot of it as taken from game invest, uh, newsletter. So just su- subscribe to that and, and you'll see more details, Eric. Uh, yeah, I'm at a, I think this is a relatively simply simple story to summarize. Um, you know, I talked to at least a dozen people about this company out there. Uh, you know, I think I understand the company without really understanding the nitty gritty of what they do, because you know how I feel about ad tech in general. But uh, so let's start with the strengths, which is something I rarely ever do. So clearly, this is a really well run company with really, really smart people. I think these are all like KKR people that are just probably the smartest people in the world, right? Um, They are a top three ad network, and they seem strategically one of the best uh, out there, you know, outside of uh, Facebook. Uh, the vertical integration was a brilliant move um, early to, uh, you know, provide an edge for their business. Um, the adjust acquisition <laughs> is interesting, and it also provides continued vertical integration, but it may alienate lots of clients in the long term. And I think that's the one point that I think uh, investors don't really try to understand or, or can understand from this business, uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, they do have a potential ability to circumvent IDFA, but I'm not sure if Apple's going to be okay with that. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, you can circumvent it all you want, but we'll see what Apple does when you try, right? Um, and finally, they're dirty. They're super dirty, right? And maybe in a good way, right? They are super smart and they're operating on the edge of what some would consider decent, I would say, <laughs> but they're very effective at it and they're doing extremely well at, at that. And so that... There's something to be said for that. Uh, I think the challenge will be that being a publicly traded company and, and getting that kind of scrutiny will um, ultimately be the undoing of some of those type of practices, right? Um, and, and maybe that's part of what we're seeing with this lawsuit as well. Uh, but I'm not really, I didn't really read up on the lawsuit. So what are the risks? I mean, fundamentally, this is not a SaaS company. It's not even close, right? It, the fact that they're getting a 20 times multiple on revenue, are you kidding me? You know, like, dude, it's obscene, right? So this is an ad network with the majority of their revenue being driven by games they have acquired, right? They're not even, these aren't even companies that they built, right? And, you know, I get this pitch on Unity, right? Unity is a SaaS company. It's a very bad SaaS company, but it's a SaaS company, but app loving is not, right? So that the, the multiple is outrageous, right? Um, again, the majority of the revenue is being driven by games. So it's basically Zynga, which trades at five times revenue versus app loving, which is trading at 20 times revenue. It, it's, it's ludicrous, right? Um, I do, th- the vertical integration is a great pitch, but the reality of these business practices that they're doing, like where they're taking the best of breed products from their customers, copying them and optimizing them using their customers' data. And it, it creates like, and, and, and ultimately alienating all these people that they're, that, that all these big accounts that are, that are providing them the data, right? That, that, that's not a sustainable model, just, just to be clear, right? They, they can't keep going, right? People will not put up with that, right? Um, and again, these practices can go unnoticed as a privately private company, but when you go public, they're like front and center, right? And, and you're, you're, people will start suing you, right? Because you are a public company, right? This is just, anyway, uh, IDFA is the threat. I mean, there's no coincidence that all these companies are going public right before IDFA, right? That who knows what's going to happen with IDFA. I think a lot of people are just completely confused. You know, it will affect their business, right? And you know, and even though they talk about them being able to circumvent it, I think it's unclear at this point. And they may try some shady shit, but ultimately, you know, Apple's not going to put up with that. You know, um, and so the other thing is like from all kind of the evidence that I see, the uh, experiment with Machine Zone has been an ultimate fail, right? Where they acquired the company for 500 million, all the games are continually to decline. Uh, My understanding is that they really don't have much experience doing live ops for core games. So their focus is primarily gonna be on casual. That's what they they do. So 
Um, so anyway, fundamentally, I think this is a really good company after saying all that, right? I think they do really good. They are amazing at what they do, but they are so way overvalued. It's obscene in my view. Anyway, uh, they face an existential threat from, sorry, ex existential threat from Apple and Google. Um, they've done an amazing job of telling the story, but I'm not sure any of this holds water, right? Um, at these valuations. Uh, I don't think this is as bad as skills because I think skills is basically a criminal organization, but I do think that they uh, have sold a bill of goods that there's not, it is impossible to live up to. And this is like very similar to the Unity story. I don't, I think Unity is actually in a bit, bit of a better place to some degree, but both of them are selling a story that they just cannot um, uh, execute against because they're not a SaaS company, they're a game company. And they should be trading five times more revenue, not 20 times. And so that means they're worth like 10, 20 bucks, maybe, you know? Um, so so a buyer beware, right? I, I, would, I would stay way, way, way far away from this, these, these, this company. So. All right. so I've got a few thoughts on AppLovin as well. And by the way, for anyone interested in AppLovin as, a, as an investment, I did cover it on Super Stonk Brothers. So uh, I'll, leave, I'll, I'll leave a note. But I think the one important concept to, to talk about is the concept that Adam Ferugi and that they keep talking about, which is the Netflix of gaming. And when you first hear about this concept, you, it's, you know, it's like, I personally was very skeptical. What, what do you mean Netflix of gaming? How does that make sense for app loving? But what they mean is, and something that you see in the S1 and they've talked about uh, over and over again, is the fact that they do like 3 trillion predictions a day and that they've got, they've been building a lot of machine learning technology. And if you think about what did the hyper casual genre and the hyper casual publishers perfect during the, the early days, which was this notion of cross promotion. And if, if you've seen one area where cross promotion works and where you have uh, models that actually work and are very predictable, it was in hyper casual. And so when you think about what is Netflix, well, Netflix is a recommendation engine. It, it understands the kind of of videos and content that you like and recommends other content. And the platform on which it operates is the app. Now, AppLovin doesn't have an app as the platform for their recommendations. And so why do they break out that the ad revenue versus the other type of revenue, the ad revenue as a segment, which, you know, which is why they, I, I think, try to reinforce how much ad revenue they make is because ads is their platform that when you think about how are they going to cross promote and how do they execute against the recommendation engine, how are they the Netflix of games, it's by cross promoting against their ad network. And that's, that's kind of what their strategy is. And when you think about their acquisition strategy, why do they acquire adjust? What are they trying to do with that acquisition? This is what their strategy is, right? And so when you think about the high level strategy, that's what they're shooting for when it comes to this concept, the Netflix of gaming. As far as the company is concerned, I do have concerns. I know Eric and Mishka mentioned a few. I, I also would say that in terms of disclosures, in the S1, they do mention that they are taking advantage of limited disclosure, uh, especially with respect to uh, some of the some financial issues as well as exec comp. And I, that's one area where I think that you're going to see <laughs> see a lot of executive compensation, stock-based comp flow out of the company. I think that the cash flows from operations are overstated. But I think that in terms of what to watch out for, I would say that the adjust acquisition, one of the things that, one of the other advantages that they have is that it just has this vast treasure trove of data of post-install events that have like uh, revenue information and the ability to have essentially like ARPU profiles against different genres of games. And so when you think about in a post-IDF deprecation world, and you've got some ability to potentially use SK Ad Network to map a player to a longer term ARPU profile, that would be a potential for them to be able to have competitive advantage over other, other players in the market. And there's been a lot of rumors about them trying to um, implement capabilities like auto ROAS and things like that, which would also give them further competitive advantage. So don't count them out. Uh, I do think they've got a tough hill to climb, but they still do have some serious competitive advantage in, in, in terms of their ability to execute. 
Next story, Adam. So you're retiring, eh? <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was actually really insightful. Why are you, why are you retiring? <laughs> um, anyways, let's move forward. Um, Sony wants to bring its top PlayStation franchises to mobile. Um, in a recent job listing, Sony is now putting out a call for a head of mobile, uh, looking for a three to five year product roadmap to bring PlayStation's most popular IP to mobile. I feel like I've heard this before. God, I mean, I feel like you, I've heard this before. You want to you want to take a job in which you're going to be like doing the Russian roulette in your head within the first few months? Yeah, there you go. Do that. <laughs> um, I'd so, love to see how they who they place there, man. That is nuts. Yeah, it, that will be a very very difficult position. So in terms of IP, just to kind of do some quick research here, the IP that Sony has that I think is relevant, Little Big Planet, MLB The Show, which of course would need MLB's permission, uh, Ratchet and Clank, Jack and Daxter, God of War, Last of Us, Horizon Zero Dawn, Uncharted, Ghost of Tsushima, uh, Spider-Man, which is unlikely. So should Sony be doing this, right? Should they be taking all this IP that obviously has, you know, great value on PC console? and um, bring this all to mobile? And what would you do as a head of games? Um, I'm speculating here, but I think obviously this is an incredibly tough job because um, you're really battling outsized expectations relative to what you have at your disposal. Um, I think the worst case here is if the boardroom is saying, build me a Call of Duty mobile with Uncharted IP, right? Like th then you've already lost and you, you've already seen this issue with Uncharted PVP mode, which they launched how many years ago? Super quick research on this as well, just to kind of talk about the tools at your disposal. Looking at Google Trends for their biggest IP, arguably God of War. It's 6% the size of Pokemon, 24% the size of Mario, 12% the size of Call of Duty. That's the rough sizing of the value of this IP. And my sense is that value of IP is exponential not necessarily linear. Um, so organic download volume of these games just will not compare to the games that have managed this transition successfully. So they should not be expecting download volumes from Mario Kart, Call of Duty, or Pokemon Go. Um, but most critical, none of these games are really aligned with a successful live model. Um, the first party development is focused on bringing powerful single player narrative experiences. Nobody wants to play Uncharted CCRPG. Nobody. <laughs> So the only game on this list that really could be aligned with the service is probably MLB The Show, but then how much brand power does that have versus, say, EA, Glues, Tap Sports Baseball? A little big planet, potentially, you know, some sandbox UGC platformer, maybe. But again, this is a three to five year roadmap, not a five plus year post-launch uh, marathon that you need to drive a UGC sandbox like Roblox did. Um, so... Besides that, you're basically getting backed into the corner of building Crash on the Runs, this Doom Archero game that was just released by uh, Bethesda, or Crazy Taxi Idol, right, Jake? Right, Jake, Joseph? Right, like these types of experiences where you take an IP, you bend it to fit an existing model, and then leverage the organic downloads for the IP the best you can. But the expectations of this path should be significantly lower than course call of duty and pokemon go um, but this pretty much just becomes a portfolio of middle ground live service games that will likely just be touch points for the brand um, it can be profitable and aggregate if run effectively but none of these are breakouts so really i think this last path really pushes you closer and closer towards the licensing and partnership path uh, where they effectively offer up their ips to other developers i wonder if they're even considering it given the description of the role but um, like looking at this, that seems like the obvious best path. Yeah. Yeah. I like on, on the paper, this makes all the sense because when you start thinking about like, think about, you know, kill zone, all these amazing IPs, and now you can play them on, on your mobile device. It makes all the sense. But the big question is, as you mentioned, is like, how do you make the move? Like, how do you make the jump to mobile? Will you go in a typical third party publishing and then, you know, second party, what, what Sony likes to do, um, and what is the time frame? That's probably the, the maybe the most important question. Like, how soon does the leadership um, expect results, and what are those results expected in, in certain time frames? Like, is it an impossible mission, or it could it be something that could be grown over the time? And in the end, is like, 
who's going to be making the calls. Like I, I kind of think about like, what are the two bad options for, for, for a person leading this type of organization? You know, number one is usually what can happen is you have somebody who's like anti, anti free to play person who's all about bringing the console quality to mobile and kind of disrespecting everything that has been happening on the mobile. And then you have the other spectrum of that is, you know, sort of a typical, what we call like an Exinga PM, AB test everything and make fast follows out of everything. So kind of, <laughs> you know, um, only one new incremental innovation to this and let's just slap an IP and an and AB test ourselves to the, uh, to the oblivion. Uh, I think the good option, good option for, for this type of person and, to, to lead this effort is somebody who has a very balanced approach, who can make smart calls without clinging to any ideology and very much looking at the market, at the product, at the capabilities of the studios. So I think it's important as, as we discuss this, like what would, what would we do in this type of position? You know, I, I think personally, it comes from, from the setting correct expectations uh, in if I'd be in this type of position, I'd, I'd probably go for sort of a quick wins. I know it it <laughs> it it's, sounds stupid to talk about like Fallout shelters and whatnot, but Fallout Shelter made hundred million over the lifetime in revenue, and it was pretty quickly done with a third party developer. So even if you can get those type of games out quite quickly, they generate positive feedback and also positive um, positive revenue, and you can kind of keep doubling down on what you want to build this this endeavor to. And I think what this could look like is something that Sony has done with its other studios. So where they start with a third party production, move into second party and eventually acquire them. Uh, but you know, the 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 issues of like the the mistakes that you can do here, like the biggest ones is, you know, building an expensive internal publishing organization. We've seen that and JK may have some kind of experience from this <laughs> firsthand. Uh, that's uh, that's probably not the, the way to go here. The, the second one is to focus on internal development. We've seen that as well. That's like the Amazon route. Hire everybody, pay them great salaries and expect them to make the biggest games ever. Uh, and then the third one is to just make very quick, rash acquisitions of studios and, and have them have them do work for you. So uh, in the end, like I would summarize it to, to having a, um, a very measured approach, uh, uh, kind of a, like a little bit of a low risk of, of grabbing a couple of low hanging fruits with third party production with a little bit of a uh, easier games and buying yourself time to set up uh, great relationships with, with few of the studios and, and most importantly, have the sort of a partnership model that would and in a win-to-win -win scenario for both the developer as well as the publisher, in this case, Sony. So, um, but Eric, you know more about Sony's business, so. I mean, I don't know. Anybody ever have a friend that works at Sony? I mean, Sony's like the worst place in the world to be innovative, right? It's it's <laughs> just the old school, like slow as fuck, you know, like total, like, you know, huge ship trying to avoid icebergs you know like it's moving like <laughs> a glacier pace it's like there's no fucking way that this is going to happen this is the same conversation that we've had with about nintendo back in the day about them making mobile games and how did that turn out right i mean like this is not like rocket science you know it happens every single time these big companies try to do something new you know it's like and anyway i, I was going to start off with the positive but clearly that didn't work out but um you know, look, mobile is a promise, right? This is the same promises that Nintendo talked about is that it introduces their IP to a huge audience that broadens out its potential appeal in theory. It's kind of a marketing opportunity. That's good. Um, mobile game development actually could build some live operations experiences when this, within the studios of Sony. I mean, the fact that they do not have live ops experience at Sony is criminal, in my opinion, right? But that's the way they've been managed for a decade, right? And that's not going to change anytime soon. So an infusion of people that are actually building live operations and building you know, games with as a service, that could be good for the organization. So from that perspective, I think this is a good strategy. Um, and of course you bring their IP to the biggest market for gaming just in general. Like, you know, anybody that went to business school or that works at McKinsey and Bain could put this together and, and create a hundred page deck about why this strategically makes sense. So I'm not gonna argue that. But the bad thing is that Sony has absolutely no freaking business building mobile games. They don't have the expertise. 
They don't have experiences with life services. They don't have any of that expertise within their organization. So this is going to be an absolutely Herculean task for Sony, right? Um, and like Nintendo, they have very, very, very few translates, few franchises that actually translate late themselves to live services because they do not make live service games, right? So it's kind of like you need one with the other to some degree. You know, like EA and Activision and and some some Nintendo franchises are, are more akin to this, but their core franchises at, at Sony are just not, period. They're like single player story-based games that do not translate at all. And this one thing that I think people always fail to acknowledge is that acquiring people, the right people to manage something like this is impossible. Like people do not want to work for Sony and do this kind of thing. Everyone knows that doing something like this in Sony is a recipe for disaster and frustration, losing hair, you know, like getting wrinkles. Like you just, you age like a thousand years by doing something like this for a, like six months, you know? So no one wants to work at Sony and build mobile games. This doesn't make sense, you know? Like you go to a mobile game company to make mobile games, right? You don't go to, within the belly of the beast of, of a console company and do that, right? And, and ultimately this outcome will probably be worse than Nintendo. So at least Nintendo had one game that did really well, right? Which, which lended itself to, mo to mobile. And the other franchises actually probably helped expand Nintendo's visibility, you know, Mario Kart and uh, the Mario Run, et cetera. Um, but being more successful than Sony, I mean, sorry, being being as successful as Nintendo is such a low bar that like, if you're worse than that, I mean, it's, it's even, I mean, it's, it's a train wreck waiting to happen. So I think the better strategy for them is to screw this idea of building any type of mobile expertise within the company and just license their shit out, right? I don't think there's any risk to that to some degree with their franchises. If you built an Uncharted game on mobile with some like third-party developer that understands mobile, then that's not going to hurt the sales of the next Uncharted, right? That those that that myth, which was perpetrated by EA for a decade. I mean, a decade. They didn't FIFA didn't want to make a mobile game because they felt felt that it was going to ruin the experience of their core game. That stuff has been gone for eons, right? So let them do that, right? Don't try to, to build mobile games. It's not going to work, right? And Nintendo's abandoning it. You know, and and it, like, I, I don't know. It's always like, I, I feel like we're always like repeating the same mistakes over and over again in this industry uh, to some degree, particularly with the big guys. Um, and I didn't get a chance to talk about Amazon, but like, you know, Amazon canceling this game. I, I mean, do, are they ha gonna have any games? Like, I guess that game, the whole game division is gone, right? In theory. So anyway, yeah, that's it. That's all I got. Anybody else on this? Amazon still has one MMO, right? I think it's New World it's supposed yeah, to come yeah. out. No, I MMO. played it. It's, I mean, good luck. Okay. They have their own engine, Lumberyard. So. Dude, no one's using Lumberyard. Come on, they don't even want to use Lumberyard, right? Like, nah, yeah. What do you mean? It's made on. It's on made on top of CryEngine. Yeah, Why dude, that, that was the worst engine ever. Like, there's not what dude. They couldn't even run that game on PCs. <laughs> you know, the second game was like impossible to run, right? Because that engine was trash, dude. It's like, <laughs> what are we talking about? Fucking Lumberyard, give me a break. All right, moving on. <laughs> so. This is not that interesting of a story, but I just wanted, I want to, I want to dispel some myths about some things just so that everyone kind of understands this, this, this thing. All right. Multiple potential. Okay. Uh, sorry. What is it? Japan. Bloomberg Japan basically said that multiple potential buyers were interested in Square Enix, right? That's what they're, that was the thing. And I have never seen a company <laughs> do a faster press release against this kind of bullshit when Square Enix basically came out and said, there is absolutely no truth to this this story basically they said and so and uh and uh they basically so bloomberg says they are quoting multiple bankers from that deal right but but it just square enix just basically said this is not bullshit we have no interest in selling our company or selling parts of our company whatever 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 so it was a pretty clear-cut denial and i know i've said in this podcast before that uh these type of press releases are could be trying to get more interest in the company. But the way this stuff was all positioned, it felt like this was like, a seems like a flat denial that Square Enix is no, not for sale. So, um, 
And I don't know if, how much familiar everyone with Square Enix. I mean, everyone knows Final Fantasy, I guess, but they've been actually relatively successful over the last few years. They're like one of the Japanese like core publishers. You have Konami, Capcom, and 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 Square Enix that has done a pretty good job. I think Capcom is doing okay as well. Konami, not so much, but. Um, you know, they have like Final Fantasy, Kingdom Hearts, Tomb Raider, Marvel Avengers. We've had issues, you know, that's there's some issues with that, but they do have some amazing IPs and there is some value there in particular for Sony. Um, uh, the article kind of suggests that Activision might be a good buyer, but this does not fit Activision strategy at all. Uh, Bobby is not have I, I almost guarantee you, not that I know Bobby personally, but I don't think he has any freaking interest in managing a Japanese company, period, end of sentence, right? So like that's not happening. But the reason I chose this article is to say one thing and to make a clear point on this. Acquiring Japanese companies is impossible, right? It is impossible for a foreign company to acquire a Japanese company. And if it's not impossible, it's so unlikely it's impossible, right? And it's similar to Korea, to France, to China. Like foreign ownerships in, in publicly traded entities within those companies, almost impossible to do. So the notion that like, Microsoft or Activision or EA is going to acquire Square Enix. It's almost an impossible proposition on its face. So I just want to be clear on that. Now, if it was another Japanese company, maybe that's possible. There is obviously acquisition between Japanese companies. That happens, right? And so something like Sony makes sense, right? Because Sony is trying to, you know, shore up their studio org with get companies <laughs> with more studios that don't know how to make live services, right? But um, but nonetheless, like they, that makes sense for a Japanese company or maybe another big Japanese conglomerate or something to own it, whatever. But the notion of, 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 of a Western company owning a Japanese company is, is preposterous in, 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 in on its face. But anyway, I just wanted to point that out. I think, I think there are, they, they do have some really good assets. I think they're doing extremely well. And they're like one of the, one of the success stories of the Japanese developers, which, which have had a lot of challenging times over the last few generations. Um, and particularly because the Japanese console market is, is, is floundering, right? Most of their business is in mobile these days. So anyway, I, uh, yeah, just wanted to point that out. Anybody have any comments on that? I mean, isn't it pretty typical for bankers to just like put together pitch decks and propose stuff to various companies and right. then maybe one of those things, one of those decks leaked out and then they're like, Oh, this is something that's happening. <laughs> that, that is far more likely. That is far more likely. Exactly. So like, um, when Chris Petrovic said in the, in the in the podcast, he's like, "Yeah, I'm so happy that I won't have see glue as a potential acquisition target on every deck that I see. See their logo pop up now, right? Similarly, like everything seems to be for sale right now. Gaming's hot, hot, hot. So why not look at Konami, Capcom, Square Enix, and put that on a on a on a slide that gets leaked, and then then people at Bloomberg just kind of throw the shit out there. That that that, that is actually far more likely than." than them actually trying to sell. So the reason that Japanese culturally, Japanese people do not, you know, like are, have a lot of pride in their companies and they're not going to sell. That's why part of the reason that CD Projekt is likely not for sale because they're like the gold standard in, in Poland, right? How many companies in Poland have any type of worldwide visibility, right? So it's like, like it's it's hard and it, it, they wouldn't want them to sell to another publisher, right? In theory. So anyway, yeah, just wanted to throw that out there. Anything else triggering this week? This this week? No, no, I think we've triggered enough. <laughs> what we we raised on App Lovin, um, Amazon, uh, somebody dissed Microsoft PMs. So <laughs> I think we've covered the, uh, the industry pretty nicely. <laughs> no, I want to be clear about App Loving. I think they're an amazing company, but they're not fucking worth twenty times revenue. Not even close. So that's that. Wait, yeah. is that a and you, know, you know what's funny is that is that like the reason that this is a kind of a broken IPO is because a lot of the sophisticated investors are not buying this shit this time, right? So they bought it with with Unity, and they're getting annihilated because the stock is down like forty percent from its highs, right? Um, and then now, like you, these guys are later to the game, and so they're getting smarter about it, right? You know, once bitten, twice shy type thing. Um, but uh, I, I, I think I think this this stock is going to have some trouble, like uh, you know, finding its footing. Um, now, what what ultimately should happen, and, and where I'd be right is if they can't grow revenue the way they suggest, right? Or the counting thing that you're talking about could be really bad for them if there's any type of adjustment on accounting. Um, in terms of how they recognize revenue, because they're like using their own network to sell their own products and advertising stuff like that. So it's a little bit murky, right, to some degree. So if, if something needs to be clarified on that side of it, that would be bad too. But yeah, they, I mean, they're, they a great gotta, 
they got a ton of earnout too. So even if the games do well, they, they they've got oh, really? massive yeah. earnout. Yeah. And I think they're capitalizing R and D. If I'm not mistaken, that's risky too. I've, um, I've heard some some interesting stuff regarding accounting. So this is in reference to certain companies that we've been talking here, and and people have reached out through back channels saying, "Dude, you're I think you're a little bit off." Uh, and that the sensor tower numbers are off. They could never be off. Sensor tower is never off. <laughs> no, sens- sensor top- tower would never be off in scale like that. Across yeah, well, in games. terms of trends, I said like in trends, he's like, yeah, in terms of a trend with the art portfolio. And this person it has a very clear view of, of, of course, how much money their games are making year over year. Uh, but anyways, uh, the, the point was there that in IFRS accounting system, um, if as if game assets are bought and not consumed immediately, they are kind of deprecating over longer time, so they are not put into revenue right away. Deferral, and what yeah. this what this person was was insinuating is he was comparing his company uh, and King, and he said in King, for example, they have only four percent of all the revenue. Um, Kind of deprecating over time because most of it is just consumed immediately, like the lives and and health and whatnot. And in in more of a um, um, mid core ish companies, what you would see is people buy skins and they buy you know uh, new levels and whatnot, more power. And because that's seen as deprecating over times, they actually have more cash in their balance sheet than than. Okay. Okay. Is- First of all, what, like I, I'm tired of this this argument about. Uh, gap and non-gap stuff like everyone looks at non-gap from a valuation perspective so it doesn't all that deferral shit is irrelevant like your deferral policy on how you defer revenue is irrelevant because one of them evaluation perspective wall street is looking at your bookings your bookings right and so um and that's the only thing i'm a little bit unclear as to whether or not you guys captured the stats right because i haven't really looked at it to be honest on, on the s1 but like do they actually do bookings? Like, do they show you bookings and all these percentages of revenues? Are, are is that bookings or is that uh, after deferred revenue? Um, so, anyway, their policies on deferred revenue are kind of irrelevant because yeah. again, they look at net mark bookings and then profitability based upon those net bookings. So, uh, adjusted for things that Joseph has issue with, but <laughs> <laughs> you could have all the issue you want, Mister Stomp. Like it doesn't matter. The whole market is looking at one way. Uh, just, just, you can just look to, at it any way you want, man. Just you to know? clarify, so you, <laughs> Eric and I are on opposite ends of whether whether you should include stock based comp and adjusted EBITDA. And so, I believe you should include stock based comp, and I believe you should actually like. Typically, you also want to smooth out for leverage, but in this. In this current environment, I, I think no, it's not the current environment, Joseph. Ninety nine point nine percent of people fucking do adjust out of stock based competition. No, no, no. I'm talking about I'm talking about leverage. You know, in terms of like in the current interest rate environment we're in, that capital capital structure is probably going to have more leverage. But like, so yeah, in terms of uh, we're going way off topic. But when you look at adjusted EBITDA, I personally would include stock based comp. I personally would include basically like acquisition expenses and things like that, especially if you've got future earnout. but that's- If that's at your own thought. peril, dude, when 99.9% of the people that are looking at the stock that matter, you know, the investors like Cap Group and Fidelity I, and T. I just do what Warren Buffett does. That's what I do. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> Set, uh, final note, send a message to JK. Tell him not to retire. DM him. <laughs> yes. Everyone and- get out there and-, and- like, tell me about I'll, I'll, I'll come for a diversity a case. We yes, need you, Joe. <laughs> See, I knew it. He's coming back. Just admitted it. He's coming back. Yeah. See you in a couple weeks. See you. Yeah. See you in a couple weeks. All right. Have a good week, All right. everybody. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.